We sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives so those who planted their crops in despair will shout hurrahs at the harvest. So those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. And then John 16, 19 to 33. Jesus knew they were dying to ask him what he meant, so he said, Are you trying to figure out among yourselves what I meant when I said, In a day or so, you're not going to see me, but then in another day or so, you will see me. Then fix this permanently in your minds. You're going to be in deep mourning while the godless world throws a party. You'll be sad, very sad, but your sadness will develop into gladness. When a woman gives birth, she has a hard time. There's no getting around it. But when the baby is born, there is joy in the birth. This new life in the world wipes out memory of the pain. The sadness you have right now is similar to that pain. But the joy coming is also similar. When I see you again, you'll be full of joy. And it will be a joy no one can rob from you. You'll no longer be so full of questions. This is what I want you to do. Ask the Father for whatever is in keeping with the things I've revealed to you. Ask in my name, according to my will, and he'll most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be a river, overflowing its banks. I've used figures of speech in telling you these things. Soon I'll drop the figures and tell you about the Father in plain language. Then you can make your request directly to him in relation to this life I've revealed to you. I won't continue making requests of your continue making requests of the Father on your behalf. I won't need to. Because you've gone out on a limb, committed yourselves to love and trust in me, believing that I came directly from the Father. The Father loves you directly. First I left the Father and arrived in the world. Now I leave the world and travel to the Father. His disciples said, finally, you're giving it to us straight in plain talk. No more figures of speech. Now we know that you know everything. It all comes together in you. You won't have to put up with our questions anymore. We're convinced you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you finally believe? In fact, you're about to make a run for it, saving your own skins and abandoning me. But I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart. I've conquered the world. This is our first Sunday without Bob as our pastor. None of us wanted this to be the outcome back when we first called him here three and a half years ago. We're in a place of great pain. We've lost several members of our congregation and we're not sure if or when they'll be coming back. Um, we've lost our pastor. We may have lost a sense of closeness to each other, of belonging. We may have lost a sense of peace and ease as we've struggled to find the best path. It's been a difficult time and it will continue to be a difficult time as we grieve these many losses. Grieving is the response to the loss of something important. It often includes physiological distress, separation anxiety, confusion, yearning, obsessive dwelling on the past, and apprehension about the future. 
I don't know if you can relate to some of those, but I did. <sighs> um, there are so many mixed emotions involved, and we can be in different places with them within ourselves. Like one day I might be here, and another day I might be there. Um, and we're in different places emotionally from each other, um, from where other people are at when processing their own grief. Um, it's not easy to walk through grief together when we're all at different places in processing what's happened in what we've lost and how we feel about it all. The word lament came to my mind as um, soon after finding out that Bob was going to be leaving. And most definitions of lament just say expressing sorrow or mourning aloud um, and that kind of sort of general thing. But there was one place I saw on the internet, if you keep digging long enough, you keep finding new things. There was one um, source that said that lament is crying out to God in complaint for the wrongs done to us. So there's grief over loss and lament about how we've been treated by others. There's also the need for us to repent, to cry out to God for mercy for the wrong things we've done. I think there's a need for us to reflect in all of these areas. Um, we're not going to get through this quickly. We're not going to get through this easily. Um, so how can we be resilient through it all? Um, it was amazing to me that around the same time that we were finding out that Bob was going to be leaving, uh, Richard Rohr's team at the Center for Action and Contemplation decided together, they discerned together that the theme for the meditations for the new year was going to be radical resilience. <laughs> um, and I decided that I would take the first two with that theme and read those to you today, and then we can have that time of quiet reflecting and then discussing what, what you've or experiencing or hearing from that or how you feel it applies to our faith and where we're at. Um, the annual daily meditations theme arises from several months of shared conversation and discernment among members of the CAC faculty and staff. CAC Dean of Faculty Brian McLaren introduces our 2024 theme. I've been invited to share with you all what our theme for 2024 will be. Radical resilience. Each of these words is important. The word radical means going to the root, going to the depths, going beneath the surface. In fact, that's what contemplation really is. It's paying deep attention to the deep dimensions of life. So radical resilience means radical, deep attention to the deepest roots of resilience. Resilience is the capacity to withstand and recover from hardship or difficulty. It has to do with the ability to spring back into shape after you've been beaten down or knocked over or bent over. I live in Florida, famous for hurricanes, and I'm a lover of trees. Many of our trees in Florida survive hurricanes by being flexible. They're able to bend an amazing amount and spring back into shape. One of my favorite trees has a slightly different strategy. It's called the gumbo limbo tree. And the way it survives a hurricane is that when the wind starts to blow, it lets its branches break off. It knows that if you can keep the trunk solid and stable, you don't get overturned by the wind. You can bounce back after the storm. And that's what the gumbo limbo tree does. It travels light through the storm. It lets go of everything that's not essential to focus on for life. Brian connects radical resilience to the work of the prophets. Prophets are insiders who love a community enough to critique it in love. They don't simply defend the community they love. They love it way too much for that. But neither do they attack it from the outside merciless, mercilessly. Oh. <laughs> Tongue twister. Nor do they attack it from the outside mercilessly and seize upon 
every imperfection to shame it and hurt it. As Richard Rohr often says, they critique with love from the edge of the inside. If we're going to help people take wise action and imagine a better future amid coming troubles, then we'll have to help people find that better future within themselves so that they can live that better future out into the world. And that's what we hope to do together in 2024. We know that we're in hard and dangerous times. We, as a global civilization, are living destructively with our planet. We're living dangerously and divisively with one another. And we're living often delusionally within ourselves. This year, we're going to seek to explore together radical resilience so we can become thermostats rather than thermometers in our world, setting the temperature, setting an example of contemplative depth and wisdom and love and peace, rather than just sinking into the fury and fear and denial and despair of so many of our times. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to a year of radical resilience. So there he is introducing the theme, and then this is the first one in the theme. To live is to change. In his New Year's homily from 2020, Father Richard Rohr preached on the biblical call to change. The Greek word for repent, metanoia, I don't know, I'm making that up. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> means to change your mind. I'd like to emphasize change because that's not something we humans as a species are attracted to. We're much like animals in this regard. Animals are creatures of habit. Those of us with a dog or a cat know that behavior is predictable. If we change some daily routine, they'll get upset. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid to say that we're much the same. We like things the way we like things. And yet, the first words out of Jesus' mouth tell us that he's come to give us a philosophy of change. Repent. Change your mind, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Psychologist Robert Wicks suggests part of resilience is making a decision to remain open to ongoing growth and change. Each of us has a range of resilience the ability to meet, learn from, and not be crushed by the challenges and stresses of life. Of even more import than the different resili resiliency ranges people have is their conscious decision to maximize the ways in which they can become as hardy as possible. They may not call this resilience, but it is their ability to be open to life's experiences and so to learn. Richard continues, St. John Henry Newman said, here below to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. <laughs> that is a very different philosophy than most of us have. One natural approach is to keep it in cruise control. The way we do it is the way we do it, and any change is considered dangerous, heretical, and new. But here in this gospel, we were given a program of change and growth from the beginning. If we don't grow, if we don't change, we end up the same at 70 as we were at 17. We all know people like that, and we may even be one of them. Such people aren't very fun to live with. They want to pick and win fights. It's what a lot of politics is today. The important thing is not the truth or what's good for the whole, but what's good for the small part of which I'm a part. If people refuse to change, what my mother used to call, used to call bullheadedness, the world will only get worse. We have to learn how to dialogue, how to forgive, how to trust, and how to give people the benefit of the doubt. In the United States, our country has become very cynical about truth and love. We hear politicians take oaths to be fair and just leaders, and we all know that doesn't mean anything. We expect everybody to be for the truth of their group and their kingdoms. But Jesus tells us to change our minds and accept the kingdom of God, which is what's good for the whole. So we'll have a time of reflection.